Well, I'm back. After 30 days of gulag, courtesy of Facebook moderators, um, this is my first upload. So I want to make it a good one. So much been going on whilst I've been banned. And uh, I just want to take you back to when I got banned. I got banned on the 10th for some random spam comment or, or post. or It wasn't even, you know, against community standards. But on the 4th of February, I posted uh, a prediction um, that Russia would invade Ukraine shortly after the Chinese uh, Beijing Olympics finish. And the Olympics wound up on the 20th and the 22nd, they'd all got their medals and gone home. And on the 24th, Putin invaded Russia. Six days later, I was banned. Um, I'm now back and I have to take issue with some of the things that I'm seeing on the news. One of them being Boris Johnson um, saying that even if chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction were used by uh, Russia, uh, we wouldn't respond, NATO wouldn't respond, the, the world would not, the West would not respond. In an exclusive interview on Sky News, the Prime Minister has warned that Vladimir Putin may be preparing to use chemical weapons. But Boris Johnson says he is still against a no-fly zone, even in the event of the use of weapons of mass destruction. Here's our political editor, Beth Rigby. Good afternoon. How are you doing? A Prime Minister in war times trying to meet the moment and put in his navy on alert. And we're going to need you out there doing a lot of stuff as fast as possible. And I thought that was a bit strange. And all the way through this last three weeks, I've seen reiterated time and time again that NATO will not be drawn into a conflict with Russia, um, or the West won't be drawn into a conflict with Russia. Yet Russia's making a lot of threats about if you involve yourself in Ukraine, we're going to nuke you. And I thought, well, this is a bit strange because most of the time, um, a nuclear deterrent is a nuclear deterrent. If one side launches all their missiles, uh, the other side has time to launch all their missiles, and everyone gets whacked. A few missiles will get taken out in defensive phases, but everyone gets whacked. That's the idea of a nuclear deterrent. Or it was, until I think 2019 was the first time I mentioned this, and that is hypersonic missile. Now, to understand what you're about to see is a two minute video on what exactly is a hypersonic missile. I'd like you to take a look at that um, and then we'll have a quick chat and then I want to get onto the main segment um, to show you exactly what these beasts can do. And all the way through this I want you to bear in mind that Russia and China have hypersonic missiles. The US does not it's trying to build them, it's failing, it's at least a couple of years away. Pretty sure the British don't have them either. So it does seem at the moment that the West is being held to ransom by superior technology. Take a look at this. Here's a question for you. What weapons can fly at more than five times the speed of sound and are virtually undetectable? Welcome to the world of hypersonic missiles. There's two types of hypersonic weapons being developed, a cruise missile that uses a super-fast scramjet to fly at hypersonic speed, and a boost glide vehicle, a warhead that's launched aboard a rocket, then released, falling to Earth at more than Mach 5, around a mile a second. A Tomahawk cruise missile flies at a speed of Mach 0.8, so close to the speed of sound. Now, by comparison, the Russian Zircon, uh, the hypersonic cruise missile, flies uh, at anywhere between Mark 8 and 10. So we're talking about a, at a nearly tenfold increase in the speed of the missile. Uh, for boost glide vehicles, the Chinese DF-17 is alleged to have speeds of Mark 10 plus. Traditional ballistic missiles follow a parabolic trajectory, a predictable arc that goes up and down like a ball. It means they can be detected early in flight. Hypersonic glide vehicles work differently. They exploit physics using drag and friction so they can fly in all directions like an aircraft. 
but at super fast speeds, making them very difficult to detect until it's too late. They fly below the uh, radar horizons, meaning that the warning times they provide are quite short. And because they are maneuverable, actually figuring out where they're headed, what their target is, it is an exceedingly difficult computing task. Most missiles rely mainly on their warhead for their destructive power, but hypersonic weapons also have huge kinetic energy. They can hit a target at more than a thousand miles an hour, literally packing a punch equivalent to over three tons of TNT. The combination of accuracy and really high kinetic energy makes it possible to break through targets with a hypersonic missile that previously you would have needed a nuclear level payload or at least something approaching it to really sort of threaten credibly. So now you can see it's an incredibly murderous weapon. It travels uh, 3,000 miles an hour, it moves about like an aircraft, it's very difficult to hit, we don't have any, and um, it, it, it has the kinetic energy impact, even without a nuclear warhead, of a nuclear bomb. I mean, you know, we saw what it, it, it did to that ship. So, um, yeah, that is a hypersonic missile. Um, there are three or four types in Earth. Uh, in Russia alone, the Dagger, the Vanguard, and the Zircon. Now, the Dagger is launched from the air, from an aircraft. The Vanguard is land-based and can be moved. It's on wheels, can even fit into a, a C-90 and fly away. And Zircon is launched from the sea. Um, but all of those um, have a, a um, bit of a drawback, as in their, their short range, or at most intermediate range. They're not long range. The, the the beastie that the Russia has just developed in the last year, and I believe tested at their um, Thunder um, Forces War Games, um, is the KH-95, which um, is one step up from their KH-47N, um, which didn't have the range. But this is a hypersonic, the KH-95 is a long-range hypersonic missile. I want you to listen out for that beastie uh, in this next clip. That um, you're about to see, and uh, we'll have a chat about that after. It was once said by Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that hypersonic weapons would become the main component of a conventional military deterrent. Russia made a bet on hypersonic weapons, and this bet has paid off. The new long range hypersonic aviation missile, KH 95 is yet another powerful testament to Russia's current technological superiority in its hypersonic program. Russia is developing the latest long-range hypersonic missile, KH-95. In principle, hypersonic technology is not a new phenomenon. The advantage of hypersonic missiles lies in their ability to maneuver at hypersonic speeds, both horizontally and vertically. Maneuvering at insane speeds makes it much more difficult for missiles to be detected by air defense systems. It is almost impossible to knock it out of the sky. All air defense and missile defense systems that have been developed in recent decades are ineffective against hypersonic missiles. Until now, we had known about three types of Russian hypersonic missiles, Dagger, Vanguard and Zircon. Each of them has its own characteristics which are associated with different combat roles, environments and modes. Dagger is launched from a fighter whilst in the air. Vanguard from terrestrial installations. Zircon from ships. All of them guarantee high target accuracy but are limited in range. The KH-95 long-range hypersonic non-nuclear missiles are capable of striking anywhere in the world. These missiles can fly along more complex trajectories than ballistic ones, which creates great difficulties in intercepting them. Now, alongside Zircon, Vanguard and Dagger, Russia has a long-range missile capable of covering a distance of 3,400 miles, leaving no chance for opposing air defense systems. The KH-95 missiles are designed to gain air superiority, something made possible under the following conditions. Destruction of enemy aircraft in the air and at air bases. Destruction of runways and taxiways. The destruction of an enemy's nuclear missile forces. Destruction and suppression of enemy air defense systems. 
violation of the enemy air defense control system, destruction of bases and warehouses with material of the enemy's air force infrastructure. To achieve these goals, a massive strike of at least 1,000 KH-95 missiles is required within the first 24 hours of an air operation. If the number of missiles were fewer, then the attacking side may lose the initiative, although this does assume that the air defense of the defending side has capabilities to intercept at least a portion of the missiles. In the case of an inactive enemy air defense system, a strike of 1,000 missiles would result in a crushing defeat of the enemy. In practical terms, a missile strike using KH-95 missiles has similar potential to a nuclear first strike. Thus, the KH-95 missile became a new statement prompting the strategic opponents of the Russian Federation to rethink their air defense tactics. Rethinking air defense tactics is not a simple task. After all, one of the advantages of hypersonic missiles is their incredible speed. The fact is, for the moment, all air defense systems have been optimized for defense against existing threats, to which hypersonic weapons did not belong. This is the primary issue. The time it takes a hypersonic missile to reach the target is so short from the moment the missile is detected to when it hits the target, only a few seconds pass by. For example, the Russian anti-ship hypersonic missile Zircon builds up to a speed of 8 to 10 Mach. This is equivalent to 8 to 10 times the speed of sound. A missile that hits a target at such a tremendous speed doesn't even need to have a warhead. The kinetic energy is so great that the destruction is comparable to the explosion of the warhead of any other non-hypersonic missile of a comparable class. Only note that the Zircon with a conventional non-nuclear warhead is capable of sinking an aircraft carrier. That is, one missile worth $1 million, 30 feet in length, and with a warhead weighing 880 pounds, is capable of sinking an aircraft carrier worth several billion. Good afternoon, I'm Marshall. How are you doing? A Prime Minister in war times trying to meet the moment and put in his Navy on alert. And we're going to need you out there doing a lot of stuff as fast as possible. This is what disruptive technology looks like. However, the disadvantage of Zircon is its short range, up to 620 miles. For this reason, the Russians created the hypersonic mid-range missile KH-47M Dagger. Its speed hits Mach 12 with a range up to 1,240 miles. This is without taking into account the combat radius of the KH-47M's carrier, the MiG-31K fighter jet. The MiG-31K, a long-range supersonic fighter interceptor, has a combat radius of 450 miles, which of course adds to the dagger's range, but does not make it dangerous on a strategic level. After all, to complete a combat mission, the aircraft would have to enter the zone of operations of enemy fighter aircraft. In this case, the likelihood of damage to the carrier of the X-47M missile increases significantly. For this reason, Russia has been actively developing the long-range KH-95 hypersonic missile. As we now see, this has turned out to be a success. The history of this project goes back to Soviet times. The project then was called KH-90. According to NATO classification, the missile was called ASX-21. At some point, the project ground to a halt, and the management of MKB Reduga, which was engaged in its development, declared the project closed forever. It turned out that this was not true. It was just another company that had taken over the project. The technical details of the KH-95 are still a military secret. The prototype at one time was a cruise missile with a folding delta wing and a fuselage housing a ramjet engine. The rocket, according to descriptions, was supposed to be equipped with a launch solid propellant and a sustainer supersonic ramjet engine, SPVRD, or hypersonic direct air jet engine, GPVRD, using kerosene. However, today one cannot rely on this data. After all, in reality, it is the carriers, strategic and long-range bombers of the long-range aviation of the Russian Aerospace Forces, that makes the KH-95 hypersonic missile truly dangerous. We are talking about the Russian strategic bombers, the Tu-22, Tu-95, and the Tu-160, aka the White Swan. Today, these Russian bombers are armed with long-range cruise missiles, KH-101 and KH-555, or nuclear cruise missiles, KH-102 and KH-55. 
These missiles are not hypersonic. The KH-101, KH-555 missiles, as well as their nuclear modifications, KH-102 and KH-55, have many advantages. But there is one significant and inherent drawback, subsonic flight speed. In other words, missiles of this type are an easy target for fighter aircraft and anti-aircraft missile systems. This is precisely why, at the time, a program for the re-equipment and rearmament of long-range strategic bombers was launched. However, the one factor that cannot be altered is the design of the aircraft. This means that the overall dimensions and weight of the new X-95 should not differ much from the dimensions of the previous weapons. As a carrier of hypersonic missiles, deserving of special attention is the Strategic Missile Carrier Bomber TU-160M. With its variable wing geometry and new second series NK-32 engines, achieving speeds of up to Mach 2.2. The first combat use of the TU-160 occurred during the Russian military operation in Syria from November 17, 2015 to November 20, 2015. The attacks were carried out by non-nuclear cruise missiles KH-555 and KH-101 against the facilities of the Islamic State. There are 16 Tu-160 missile carriers in the fleet of the Russian Aerospace Forces today, but not all of them have a modernized propulsion unit with second series NK-32 engines. It is planned to build around 50 Tu-160Ms with new engines at the Kazan Aircraft Factory. The rest of the White Swans are gradually being upgraded to the level of the updated version of the Tu-160M. The strategic missile carrier Tu-95MS also received an upgraded engine. The tests were completed in the middle of this year. The Tu-95MS is the hero of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the world's only serial bomber and missile carrier with turboprop engine. The only way to contain the KH-95 is to create similar missiles or a new antidote against them. There are currently eight separate hypersonic missile programs in the USA, but it is still too early to talk about the appearance of a hypersonic arsenal. During recent tests of a prototype missile, the AGM-183A Air Launch Rapid Response Weapon off the coast of Southern California, the missile separated from the bomber, but the jet thrust did not turn on. The jet engine had caught fire and the rocket was unable to complete its mission. According to some reports, China has made further progress. The Chinese military says that the DF-17 medium-range hypersonic missile is capable of reaching Mach 10. However, this missile is not long-range either. The DF-17 missiles have a range of 1,550 miles, which puts them in the class of intermediate-range missiles. The newest Russian anti-aircraft missile system, SAM, S-500, is able to intercept hypersonic targets, which means the S-500 is a completely new type of air defense system. Almaz Ante engineers managed to implement the principle of solving multiple aims by including destructive as well as ballistic and aerodynamic goals. The S-500 air defense system entered mass production in the fall of 2021. Initially, the air defense missile system was created to protect Moscow, but in the course of its development, the list of its possible uses has expanded. Now the S-500 air defense system can be used in any other theater of operations. Transportation can be carried out on board military transport aircraft, or over land, the air defense missile system moves on wheels. Also considered an effective means of protection against hypersonic missiles is the over-the-horizon early warning radar known as the container. This can track over the curved radians of the Earth and scan the horizon for long-range targets. The container's focus can extend to more than 5,000 air targets, including hypersonic missiles. It turns out that Russia has found a way to create an extremely effective weapon and immediately come up with a means of protection. Well, there you have it. Um, I've got one more video to show you, but I mean, by about now you should be thinking, well, hold on, if you know that missile can be launched from Russia and reach the White House in five minutes, yet it takes the president 15 minutes to get from the White House uh, via Marine One onto Air Force One and then out of any potential blast on at least minimum 15 minutes. I mean, with Biden. <laughs> going to be a bit longer than that so um, if you apply that same logic to here if a KH-95 was launched from um, the 
meet 31k or the white swan out just outside of our radar um, area um, we'd be whacked within a minute uh, and I think it's about time somebody said something to the right honourable Ben Wallace who is the Secretary of State um, he spent time at Sandhurst um, an email or two asking do we have any credible form of deterrent or defence against the Russian KH-95 hypersonic missile because Russia is saying that it's going to strike decision making sensors as well as targets that are firing missiles at them. Decision making sensors, what does that mean? Think about it. Where are all the decisions made in this country? Where is the legislation? Where are, who makes all the decisions? Parliament of course. And considering Russia's there, the United States is there and we're about there with Ukraine there if it takes five minutes to get to the US, how long does it take to get to us? And again, if they launched it 400, 500 miles out of their, um, on, on one of their aircraft, that shortens the um, impact time again. Incredible. Like this weapon is exactly what it says hypersonic, Mac 10. Um, it's one to watch. Um, I'm going to throw up one more video that um, really sees this out and these are all credible in fact some of them are military uploads um, these videos came out um, in 2019 2020 and um, as you heard these um, missiles have all gone into um, active duty from 21 and into 22 the zircon is now active in 2022 kh95 is active um, so I think it's it's quite um, alarming that nobody's mentioning this. Is this why Biden uh, is saying we're not going to be drawn into a war? We, you know, we're defensive. NATO is defensive. Well, how defensive are you if you have no deterrent? The same with Boris. Boris saying, oh, they could drop chemical bombs on the Ukraine. Oh, that'd be all right with it. You know, no, no, we, we can't respond. Why can't you respond? And I think the answer is we're already beat if they've got these weapons and they can do what they say they can do we're going to have a huge problem and to be honest Putin's already said there'll be consequences for the UK for um, its involvement in supplying arms um, to the Ukraine and um, I find it you know, very very strange that none of the nuclear powers none of the nuclear uh, countries that are hold in the West that hold nuclear power are actually standing up to face down the bully. Um, I think they know that with this technology, China and Russia are unstoppable. We're going to continue to stand together with our allies in Europe and send unmistakable message. We'll defend every single inch of NATO territory with the full might of the united and galvanized NATO. We will not fight a war against Russia in Ukraine. Direct confrontation between NATO and Russia is World War III, something we must strive to prevent. But we already know Putin's war against Ukraine will never be a victory. He hoped to dominate Ukraine without a fight. He failed. He hoped to fracture European resolve. He failed. He hoped to weaken the transatlantic alliance. He failed. <laughs> He hoped to split apart American democracies in terms of our positions. He failed. The American people are united. The world is united. And we stand with the people of Ukraine. We will not let autocrats and would-be emperors dictate the direction of the world. Democracies are rising to meet this moment, rallying the world to the side of peace and the side of security. We're showing our strength, and we will not falter. God bless all of you. God bless Ukraine and God bless our troops. The White House has said that that Russia may use chemical weapons or create a false flag operation to use them. What evidence have you seen showing that? And would the U.S. have a military response if Putin does launch a chemical weapons attack? I'm not going to speak about the intelligence, but but uh, Russia would pay a severe price if they use chemical. Weapons. The
that Serkin, a real threat to America. As noted Russian journalist Pavel Felgenhauer pointed out in November 2021, President Vladimir Putin declared that if the West deploys missiles to Ukraine that could reach Moscow in 5 to 10 minutes, Russia is ready to counter by deploying a new naval hypersonic missile, which may reach Western decision makers in 5 minutes, flying at Mach 9 speed. Russia's new nuclear capable naval hypersonic missile, the Serkin, was hyped by Putin as having a speed of Mach 9, stating that it would become operational in 2022. The context of Putin's statement was preparations for a Russian invasion of Ukraine, not NATO missile deployments. Nine days after Putin's nuclear threat, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov warned about a Ukraine conflict becoming a new Cuban missile crisis. Ten days after Putin's nuclear threat, Russian Chief of the General Staff General of the Army Valery Gerasimov declared, any provocations by the Ukrainian authorities to settle the Donbas difficulties militarily will be thwarted. Putin's claimed timelines for U.S. missiles attacking Moscow from Ukraine are ridiculous. He said, I will repeat this once again, that the issue concerns the possible deployment in the territory of Ukraine of strike systems, with the flight time of 7 to 10 minutes to Moscow or 5 minutes in the case of hypersonic systems. Since the U.S. only has some sonic cruise missiles, which travel at less than Mach 1, their flight time would have to be over five times greater than Mach 5 hypersonic missiles, and Mach 5 is only the threshold of hypersonic speed. What Putin was talking about had nothing to do with the deployment of U.S. missiles to Ukraine. However, it was apparently aimed at deterring any U.S. effort to support Ukraine against Russia which was threatening an invasion through the threat of nuclear strikes against decision-makers. The supposed U.S. deployment of missiles in Ukraine that could reach Moscow is purely fictional. It is literally a rehash of Soviet-era propaganda that the U.S. Pershing Ryuch-2 was a strategic ballistic missile threat Moscow. The Pershing-2 was designed to have insufficient range to attack Moscow. Its nuclear warhead was not capable of destroying hard and very deeply buried targets such as the Moscow bunkers. The penetrator warhead that could attack hard and very deeply buried bunkers was terminated in the FY 1982 budget process. The U.S. at some point may deploy conventional missiles. The distinction between conventional and nuclear-capable missiles is very important. In Europe to counter Russian nuclear-capable missiles, that were originally deployed in violation of the INF tree. However, Ukraine is the last place in Europe where they would be deployed. Moreover, Putin's claim that the US could attack Russia in 5 to 10 minutes is bogus. This would require hypersonic speed. It would take about an hour for subsonic cruise missiles to reach Moscow from Ukraine. At a minimum, the U.S. is at least years away from the earliest availability of any type of hypersonic missile. Moscow was and is the most heavily defended city in the world. Thus, existing subsonic missiles could be intercepted. Indeed, in April 2015, Major General Kirill Makarov, Deputy Commander of Russia's Aerospace Forces, Command, even claimed, Moscow's layered air defense grants 99% effective defense against air attack due to the deployment of S-400 and SA-20 defenses. In addition, conventional missiles cannot destroy hard and very deeply buried targets. President Putin began to threaten attacks against the U.S. national leadership in 2019 in his annual State of the Nation address to the Russian Duma when he said that if the U.S. deployed missiles to Europe, Russia will be forced to create and deploy weapons that can be used not only in the areas we are directly threatened from, but also in areas that contain decision-making centers for the missile systems threatening us, and that their decision-makers should calculate the range and speed of our advanced weapon systems. What he meant was that the time required to get the president from the White House to Air Force One 
and outside of the nuclear blast radius from an attack on the White House was greater than the flight time of Russian nuclear-capable hypersonic missiles. God bless all of you, God bless Ukraine, and God bless our troops. A day after the Putin speech, the main government news agency T, a SS, reported that Putin cautions have threatened Russia could target U.S. missiles hosts and America as well. Numerous major news organizations interpreted his speech as saying Russia will target the U.S. if it deploys missiles to Europe. They did not pick up on his threat against the U.S. National Command Authority. Just after Putin's 2019 speech, Russian state television listed U.S. military facilities that Moscow would target in the event of a nuclear strike and said that a hypersonic missile Russia is developing would be able to get them in less than five minutes. The targets included the Pentagon and the presidential retreat in Camp David. The White House has said that, that Russia may use chemical weapons or create a false flag operation to use them. What evidence have you seen showing that? And would the U.S. have a military response if Putin does launch a chemical weapons attack? I'm not going to speak about the intelligence, but, but uh, Russia would pay a severe price if they use chemical weapons. Just a few days after this, in an important speech, the chief of the Russian general staff, General of the Army Valery Gerasimov, said Russia was forced to plan future delivery of strikes against decision-making centers. Just after Putin's November 2021 hypersonic missile threat, Izvestia, a major Russian publication, reported that sources in the defense ministry told Izvestia that they plan to test the new weapon, that Sirkin hypersonic missile, and also the methods of its employment within the Grom exercises. Grom Thunder is a name given in 2019 to the annual Russian Large Strategic Nuclear Exercise. The Russians announced that Grom 2019 involved over half of the Russian strategic nuclear forces and reportedly ended in a massive Russian nuclear strike. This year, Russia either did not hold this exercise or more likely did not announce it and refrained from the usual multiple strategic missile launches, which are a dead giveaway for this exercise. In October 2021, October is the normal month for Grom. Russia exercised every element of the Russian triad but conducted only one strategic missile launch. The integration of the Tsirkin hypersonic missile in Grom 2022 would operationalize Putin's hypersonic nuclear threats to our national command authority. The main role of Russian hypersonic missiles is not penetrating U.S. strategic missile defense, which is not a significant threat to Russian strategic nuclear forces but rather to be able to destroy critical time urgent strategic and command and control facilities, exploiting the vulnerability of the U.S. nuclear command and control system. This is very dangerous because it could become the Russian theory of victory in a nuclear war. It is a very fragile theory of victory because if the effort to destroy our national command authority fails, rapid escalation of the conflict is likely. The political context of the threat, the threatened Russian invasion of Ukraine, makes it even more serious than the more routine Russian nuclear threats. Well, there you have it. Like I said, one hell of a murderous weapon. And um, the, the kinetics of um, a missile like this um, making an impact, it doesn't even need a nuclear warhead. Um, it's an interesting, an interesting turn, but I, I, I think um, ben Wallace needs to step up and explain to us um, what what exactly we've got in our arsenal that can stop these. These are all operational as of two, uh, 2022, um, and uh, it, it just beggars belief. I don't I don't quite understand it. Anyway, it's nice to be back. I don't suppose I'll be back very long. Um, I've pretty much walked away from social media while I've been uh, on this Facebook ban. I've just um, not even switched on Facebook. I've, I've stayed completely away. I've been engrossed in researching these missiles and um, 
what they uh, what they what they mean to the Western free world. <laughs> I think the Western free world leaders are shitting themselves. That's what I think. In an exclusive interview on Sky News, the Prime Minister has warned that Vladimir Putin may be preparing to use chemical weapons. But Boris Johnson says he is still against a no-fly zone, even in the event of the use of weapons of mass destruction. Good afternoon. How are you doing? A Prime Minister in war times trying to meet the moment and put in his navy on alert. And we're going to need you out there doing a lot of stuff as fast as possible. Camel Laird Shipyard in Merseyside, a base that's been building military ships for hundreds of years. If I just push this forward, yeah. nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. No,